Welcome, friend. I'm glad you could join us today. I'm Pastor Peter Neary, and I'm here with Pastor Ryan Johnson, and we're both pastors of the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. For today's special testimony session, Pastor Neary is going to share his powerful testimony of how the Lord called him into the ministry. I don't want to waste any more time. Pastor Neary, take it away. Okay, well, I'm glad to be able to do it. I was living in uh, northern Wisconsin, where it's really cold, mm. Superior, Wisconsin, right on Lake Superior. And um, I was teaching church school in Duluth, Minnesota. I was the church school teacher. And I was a member, though, of the Superior Wisconsin Church. That's two different states across the big, huge high bridge mm. um, over the St. Louis River that flowed right into uh, Lake Superior. And, um, and because I was a member of the Superior Wisconsin Church, they voted me to be head assistant to the pastor. Mm. I was single at the time. And so I had the ability of assisting the pastor on many of the functions that he had to do. And so every day I would go to the church school and I would teach um, my class. And by the way, I'd always go early and I'd kneel by every desk of every kid before they came to school and prayed for them. And uh, it was a small church school, by the way, so I had 12 students, around 12 to 18 students. And, um, and one day I went home, and the pastor called me on the phone, and he said, I, I just got this call from a lady who's a member of the Superior Wisconsin Church, but she doesn't come. And her husband just died. Oh. And so he said, we've got to go see her. So I'll come by, pick you up, and we'll go over there. And so the pastor picked me up. We drove over there. And I want you to remember, I was really happy teaching church school when this took place. And uh, when we got to the house, we knocked on the door. And this lady came to the door. And she opened it and welcomed us. And I could tell she was very distraught. Mm. She appeared to be all alone except for her husband who was now passed away. And I watched the pastor as we were in the room. And he was very loving and compassionate and thoughtful and encouraging. You know, I was thinking just how Jesus was when he was here on this planet ministering to the, the people that needed him. And then all of a sudden, he said, let us pray. So we knelt down right there in the front room of this lady. And by the way, this was a while ago. Mm -hmm. The front room of this lady had an oil burning stove. Oh, yeah. Okay. And for doors were curtains. No doors. Why? Because the curtains would allow the heat to go through because there was only an oil burning stove in the front room. And uh, I tell you that, that's how long ago it was, and that's the situation this woman lived in. And so we, we knelt down to pray, and the pastor prayed. And as he was praying, I felt the presence of God in that room. And now you see, Pastor, I tell you this because when she opened the door, and I looked at her, and I remembered she hasn't been coming to church. I am ashamed to say to you, I thought, yeah, you don't come to church, mm. but when something tragic happens, mm. you call the church. Mm. I had that in my head. And remember, by the way, I, got, I was a new, uh, a new Seventh-day Adventist convert. I hadn't been one very long. And and so I was, you might say, learning the rope, so to speak. But you know, when that pastor knelt and prayed, it was as if this woman was the most important person of the church. It was as if this person 
was was just a a normal member who regularly supports the church, comes to church, and I felt God's presence. And friend, when I felt God's presence, I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I had those negative thoughts um, when she first opened the door. And then I realized that, that Jesus is really real, that Jesus really cares about people, and all of a sudden, as we were driving home, he was taking me back to my apartment, a thought popped in my head that I never had before. And that was, I want to be a minister. And believe me, up until that point, that was the last thing I ever thought I wanted to be. But I felt that presence of God. I saw how, how God came into that simple home of this lady who really wasn't um, faithful to God and what she knew and what she believed. And because she needed him, he was there during that prayer. I remember too, by the way, I, I was almost afraid to open my eyes while the prayer was going on. Hmm. So I went home. And I also want to tell our friends this, that I don't know how I got this, but from the very beginning of joining the, the Superior Wisconsin Seventh-day Adventist Church, I believe that every day I should have personal devotions. So every morning I would get up early before church school, and I would kneel down and pray. And by the way, Superior Wisconsin, I'd kneel down by the, by the steam heater. <laughs> you know, the one that goes pss when it goes on, and then it gets real hot, and then it gets real cold. Yeah, this was a while ago. I, and I would pray. And then when I was done praying, I would turn a light on, and I would read my Bible. And I always had a plan for reading my Bible. I just didn't, you know, like yeah. flop it open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that God always knew where I was going to be so he could speak to me mm -hmm. for that particular day. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, I just wanted to say this. I would usually, after that, I would spend a little time reading a book about, you know, Jesus mm -hmm. or the church or something. Mm -hmm. So this was my daily fair. I had personal devotions. And I got home and I thought, I want to be a minister. But how dare I be a minister? Or how can I be a minister unless God calls me to the ministry? Fair. And so every morning I got up and I would pray. And when I got to the end of my daily prayer, I would then say, Lord, I want to be a minister. If you want me to be a minister, you got to call me to the ministry. Amen. I did this for a year oh, and wow. a half. Wow. Because I don't know why, but I just had it in my head that, that I, I, God has to call me to the ministry. By the way, I, I want to say this to our friends. There might be some out of, out who are, are with us today that want to be a minister. And whenever anybody comes to me or you, when we talk to them, we tell them, if you want to be a minister, make sure you're called by God. Mm -hmm. This isn't just a job. And so I really felt that. I was impressed, and I look back now, I know it was the Holy Spirit. For a whole year and a half, I prayed every single morning. and. And then, a year and a half later, I got up out of bed. I knelt down by the uh, steam heater, the radiator, the steam radiator heater. You know, there, there may be some watching that don't even know what I'm talking about. But I'm noticing that all of the moving experiences that you have take place in the wintertime. Okay? <laughs> they do. God will speak in the summer, too. I'm <laughs> Yeah, he does. And I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was good, though. That's very true. 
So I'm kneeling down by it, and I'm praying my prayer. I got to the end, and I said, and Lord, if you want me to be a minister, I want to be a minister. If you want me to, then you have to call me to the ministry. And all of a sudden, in my head, not, not a burning bush or this bright, brilliant angel showing up, in my head I heard, I want you to be a minister. I've been praying for a year and a half, right? Yeah. So what was my response? I began to cry uncontrollably. I fell forward on my face and I said, God, I can't be a minister. And I'm just crying. I can't be a minister. And by the way, in a split second, the brain is just fantastic. In the split second, when I heard that voice, I want you to be a minister, my mind went to the little Superior Wisconsin Seventh-day Adventist Church and how periodically some of the state officials would come up to preach. And all of them were very um, uh, organized and administrative. And I thought to myself, I'm, I'm none of those things. I, I'm not like that. I, I can't be a minister. And I'm crying, you know, and when I'm crying, my face is a mess. And all of a sudden, the boy said this, yes, but you pray. I'm telling you, my friend, that's exactly what I heard. Yes, but you pray. And, and the minute I heard that, while I'm... You know, I'm on my face, and I'm crying and trying to keep the fluids under control. And, and I suddenly sat up and, and tried to, you know, to calm down. And I, I honestly said, yes, but you pray. Hmm. I mean, Pastor, it didn't make any sense to me. It mm -hmm. didn't. And, and I was so emotional that, you know, maybe it took time. There is a time lag in my brain what to do. And the voice again said, yes, but you pray. And so I thought, yes, but you pray. Yes, but you pray. I pray and you tell me what to do. Yes, came that voice. Well, then I can be a minister. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, all of a sudden, I realized that prayer is the key of every Christian person. If you're a Christian, prayer has to be an absolute vital part, a daily part of your life. But in this instance, God said to me, you pray about the things that the church needs, or how to act, or how to organize, or how to administrate, and I will tell you what to do. And so I will never forget that voice and what that voice said. And so I was halfway through another school year when that voice spoke to me, and at that very point I began laying the plans for resigning at the end of the school year, enrolling in the Andrews University Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And I began to move towards that because God said, yes, but you pray. So I'd like to turn to a text that's found in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And in fact, it's under the section where Paul writes about the whole armor of God. And then he goes down all the armor. And when he's done talking about the armor, the, you know, verse 17 is the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. We then get to verse 18. And here's what Paul says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication 
in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and all supplication for the saints. So look at this. Pray, praying, prayer, supplication, watchful, perseverance, supplication again. I thought prayer is really important. <laughs> and by the way, I believe that prayer is part of the whole armor of God. We ain't got done with the helmet and the sword of the spirit. He then told that we need to be in prayer about everything. So my friends, I became a Seventh-day Adventist minister, and I want you to know this. 40 years now. 40 years because the Lord told me to pray, and he would tell me what to do. I also discovered that he also brings good people to work with me, and that also helps. <laughs> But prayer is the essence of Christianity, connecting with God every day, and then reading the Bible to hear his voice. And you know, that means some of you could be a pastor too. And by the way, Pastor Johnson, Sir? you have an interesting story that I, I would like you to tell our friends too. I would love to. But respectfully, before I get into my testimony, I would like to say, because Pastor Neary won't say, that even to this day, 40 years after the Lord spoke to him, Pastor Neary is known all over the world as the praying pastor. He serves as the prayer coordinator for our conference, has for other conferences, and his lesson of prayer he has never forgotten, and he's passed it on to foolish creatures like myself. Pastor Neary, um, I hope you won't be mad at me, but before I go into my testimony, you weren't always Seventh-day Adventist. No, I do, wasn't. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Well, I was, um, I was born and raised in Geneva, Illinois in the Roman Catholic Church, and the name of the church was St. Peter. That's how I think I got my name. He's Peter Neary. Yeah, I'm Peter Neary. And uh, my mother gave me that at my confirmation. So uh, Roland then added Peter mm. Neary. So I was in Geneva, Illinois, outside of Chicago, and raised a Roman Catholic. I got my college degree and I wanted to go to graduate school. And that's biology. Yeah, in biology. And so I enrolled in, of all places, Superior, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin in Superior for biology. Mm -hmm. I thought perfect setting, you know, Lake Superior right there. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful wilderness areas. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, I got this invitation to inviting me to attend these meetings. And what's really interesting, it's, it was in an obscure place that isn't even a town. It's, it's a church out in the country, uh, just south and, and east of Superior, Wisconsin in the middle of a wooded area was a little church and they were holding evangelistic meetings at that little church. They didn't even have bathrooms. Huh. There was an outhouse in back. Huh. And I went to those meetings. And I sat there night after night and listened to what the Bible said. I went home at night and I would, you know, reread and check what I had just learned. Pastor, I said to myself, I, I never heard this stuff before. I didn't, I didn't know the Bible said this. And you know, I was drinking, I was smoking, heavily. And with their help, 
and introducing me to Jesus and his will for my life in the Bible, I no longer smoke. Amen. I no longer drink. And by the way, I guess I was like a sailor. <laughs> eloquent. Huh? Yeah, eloquent, yes. <laughs> and, and it's just amazing. God got a hold of me, and he was patient with me as I was learning his will for my life. It didn't just, you know, snap happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, I attended those meetings at a church that didn't even have bathrooms. That's how small it was, by the way. Um, in fact, there was only one Sabbath school class beside the sanctuary, and it had a folding accordion uh, separator. Mm -hmm. Not even a wall. Yeah. And they had meetings out in this nowhere place. And I went to them. And I just, I was thanking Jesus that he was so patient with me. That he didn't give up on me. Because yes, you say I'm a pastor and I might look to you fairly uh, uh, acceptable. But. And yeah, I, I had a master's degree and everything, but I was, I was a rat inside. And, and, and he gave me a reason to continue to live. By the way, I was baptized in Lake Superior. Do you know how cold that is? I was going to say, was it wintertime? Was it? No, it wasn't wintertime, <laughs> but it wasn't summer either. It was the fall. Do they have summers up there? <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, you were... You were raised Catholic, and I, maybe this question is too in-depth to be able to answer in one breath, as it were. <laughs> but take your time, I pray. What convinced you? I mean, what was it? You'd been going to these meetings. What happened? I'm really glad you asked that, because this is an integral part, and I think it would be helpful for our friends to hear. Remember, I was there at graduate school. Mm -hmm. I wanted to better myself. I wanted more education so I had more opportunities availed to me. But the things I did and the things I thought were embarrassing. See, my mom and my dad were wonderful uh, Christian people. And they didn't raise me to smoke. They didn't raise me to drink. They didn't raise me to swear. Mm -hmm. and, and I had this selfishness about me where I wanted, if I wanted something, I would walk over people to get it. And so here's the way I put it. And, and this is real. I would shave in the morning. And on some mornings, I couldn't even look myself in the eye in the mirror for the things I had done the night before. Coming from this loving family, educated, had a job, and yet I would do crazy things. And, uh, and so I, I just, you know what? I don't even know if I sensed that I needed something. But God sent me a friend. Hmm. And that friend was studying with Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. And I never heard of them before. And he, not an Adventist, is the one that invited me to the meetings. And when I sat there and I heard all this, all of a sudden I saw a way that I could shave in the morning and look myself in the eye. I. I found a savior who I didn't have to do crazy things with my buddies so that they would accept me and they'd always want me around and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, pay attention to me and all. I found a savior that didn't care if I was the smartest, the richest, the best looking, whatever. He loved me way I was. Amen. And so that is the essence 
But notice, some people come to us, you know, and they go, well, I'm missing something in my life. I don't even think I knew that. But instead, he sent a person, not even an Adventist, who invited me to those meetings. We were baptized together. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. In Lake Superior, with no waiters. <laughs> <laughs> He teases me because whenever we do baptisms, I wear those waders so that, so that I'm dry afterwards and I can get back into my suit. And he's kind of like, that's not real baptism. <laughs> Guys, right now we have to pause because after a testimony like that, you may be asking yourself, how can I get that Jesus? Well, you can. If he can save knuckleheads like us, <laughs> surely he can save you. Yes. We want to invite you just right now in the middle of our testimony time. Come on down and visit us at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church, 4575 South Sand Hill Road, Las Vegas, Nevada. Come on by and talk to one of the preachers. Let's pray together. Now, if you want to worship with us, we are worshiping on Saturdays. Isn't that yes, true, sir? Yes, we worship on Saturdays. On the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. What's that about? Come on over. Let's talk about it. But you can read a little bit about it in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. But come and worship with us at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church. On Saturdays, we have Sabbath school beginning at 9 o'clock. And at 1050, our main service begins. Let's pray and get close to Jesus yes. together. Pastor, the thing that, that really strikes me when I hear this, is that the Lord will take time to speak to us, mm. little old us, tiny little us. Mm -hmm. He keeps the world spinning on its axis. He keeps the galaxy spinning in space, keeps time moving in the correct direction and yet takes some of that time to speak to us. And we are that special to him. Yes. We get people that come into our offices and one of the main things that plagues people in this day of entertainment and leisure is that they feel insignificant. Yeah. Does anybody love me? Does anybody care about me? I was, oh boy, 20 years of age had a different background than you did, sir. I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. uh, I call that being a lifer. <laughs> I'm a convert, you're a lifer. <laughs> My dad, uh, who is a chemist, also lay pastored in small churches. And it's funny because we're pastors at this big church here, but the way I grew up was in these little teeny churches where if it needed to be done, then you needed to go and do it the singing, the playing, the piano, just oh, yeah. the Christmas programs, everything. And uh, that's what you call making it on your parents' religion. Now, you know, I have quite an interesting life past in area. I've been homeless. I've been almost dead several times, beat up, robbed, all of this. And all of those things were the Lord giving me my own experience with him. And I was on my way. But when I was 20 years old, my best friend, and I'm never gonna be the kind of person that has a billion friends, I just have a few. Uh, I won't say his name because even though it's been all this time, the pain still rattles in the community of Charlotte, North Carolina, where I basically grew up. My best friend was coming home from church one evening and uh, someone came up to the window and shot him point blank and I lost my friend that was not a good day his mother calling around somebody go out there and be with my boy I have to tell you that was one of the things that inspired me to go and, and become a physician which is um, how I'm trained friends but it was not my calling I went through a very dark period because I could not understand 
how God could allow something like that to take place. We've been talking about it recently, haven't we? Mm -hmm. That the devil, yeah. who as a former covering cherub, used to be in the presence of God, then came out and uses all of his energy to misrepresent God's character. He does stuff and we blame God. Yeah. And sometimes it is very effective. I remember the day of my friend's funeral, I was on my way, tears in my eyes, and I was swerving and I got pulled over by the police. I never told you that. And he walked up to the window and he leans in. And I'm not the most benign looking guy. <laughs> young fellow looked at me and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to my friend's funeral. And he just said, be safe. The lack of kindness there. Yeah. I didn't want anything to do with God after that. I was done, finished. I'm gonna go make my own way in the world as it were. But I have one of those things called a praying mama, not a praying mother, that's something else. A praying mama, <laughs> it denotes a degree of fear. Yeah. And mama was determined that regardless, her children, all three of us, I'm in the middle, are all gonna make it to the kingdom. We're gonna be sitting at the welcome table as a family, come what may. And my mother would pray and pray. And because I'm scared of my mother, she would force me to do things in church, you know, when I was uh, in town and I hated it severely. I really did. One time she asked me to do something. I was dating a young lady and I did this thing in the church and I was absolutely furious, furious, furious about even being in proximity with these God worshiping people when I didn't want anything to do with him. On that day, there was a, a man visiting the church and um, I was up front doing something for Youth Day, as it were, and got down as soon as I could. Now in the South, they do that here a bit. When you finished being up front, they line you up at the door so that the church members can come out, the ladies in their hats, men in their ties, and they can shake hands with you. And I'm there all with my lips stuck out. People are coming by and shaking hands. And this, this, this gentleman, a African-American, older, salt and pepper hair, he reaches his hand out. I didn't even look him in the eye. He grabs my hand and then before I could let go, he clamped down on it and he looked at me and he says, son, are you an evangelist? And I looked into his eyes, not even <laughs> realizing. And I laughed in his face and I said, I'm gonna be a doctor. And I said it with disdain, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, please. Mm -hmm. That man was a preacher by the name of C.D. Brooks, who was a very well-known evangelist, whom the Lord used on that day to see a floundering young man and remind him that the Lord had plans for him. But something about this encounter, him cutting to the quick, made me angrier. I mean, I was literally cursing mad. So after church, things did not go well. And I'm sitting there fussing inside and some outside. And as the sun went down, my girlfriend says, you know what, Ryan, you need to calm down. And she was a preacher's daughter. And she said, um, tell you what I'm gonna Lord do. Lord stacked the deck on you, <laughs> That's because I'm, so hard, I, I'm so hard headed. I'm so hard headed. You got to hit me yeah. really hard. Some people can take a whisper. Some of us are too stupid. <laughs> she says to me, let's go to a restaurant and get you some French fries. Because I really like French fries, particularly, and we are paid for this. I like the steak fries that they sell at Red Robin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was the thing to say, because I mean, I was so angry, so angry. Every time I closed my eyes, I could, I could see things that I did not want to remember. And so she drove me over to Red Robin. 
while I was continuing, I mean, to fuss and cuss in this car. And we get to the restaurant and we get out and we're walking in and I'm fussing all the way in. And then when you get inside, you gotta fuss quietly, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> the person waiting on us said, would you like a booth? Seems like you want something far away. My girlfriend says, yes, please. And she sat us far away. And once we were sitting, I began to say some things. And this is what I said. I will never be a preacher. I don't want anything to do with God. And as I finished saying that, the door opened on the far end of the restaurant. It was, it, it didn't say this, but it was one of those doors like sometimes you see, and if you open this door, an alarm will sound, it'll cause a rip in the space-time continuum. People with helicopters will come and don't open this door. Right, it was positioned like one of those, but it didn't have all that on it. The door opened and this young Caucasian male came in. When I see him in my mind, and I'm old now, so everybody looks young when they're, when they're young. I, I, I remember him as being somewhere between 17 and 20. Baby face, no hair, young brown hair, uh, no hair on his face, excuse me, brown hair. And I don't remember what he was wearing or anything, but he walks in and he's got our eye. And so I just sat there watching this young man walk across the restaurant and weave himself around the tables. And this took a while. And then he gets to our table and he just sits there looking at me with this grin on his face. Yeah, I love this story. <laughs> he sticks his hand out to my girlfriend and she takes it. And then he looks at her and then gives his hand to me. It's like this dance, like, you know, I take his hand, but he continues to stare at my girlfriend. So I'm holding this guy's hand. He's staring at my girlfriend and the machismo, you know, the, yeah, right. the testosterone, <laughs> you know, it went from mm -mm to mm -mm 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 -mm. it just began to pump through. And I clamped down the fool that I was and down my guess. I clamped down on his hand. And I say in my toughest voice, may I help you? And then he turns to face me. I would have been on his left. He was on my right. And he says, still smiling, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And I said in that same super macho voice, try me. And he said, okay. God sent me here to tell you that you will be a preacher. Wow. <laughs> he said something else to me. Pastor Neary knows what it is, but yeah. I'm not going to say that part here, but it involved exactly what that would look like. I'm going to fast forward in the story and just say I have watched in awe my wife, myself, my family as this prediction has come to pass piece by piece in my life. But let's go back. He says this to me, and I'm very interested in your reaction to your experience when you heard that voice, because that's the reaction that the young lady had. She begins to cry. She had the good sense to be afraid in the presence of God, and I was an idiot. I'm holding his hand and I'm shocked, and he lets go and turns and begins to walk all the way back out of the restaurant. And I was angry. How dare you walk into my life? And I guess now that I'm old and crusty, I can look back and, and see a bit more of what was angering me. Where were you before when I needed you? Not realizing he was there because I needed him. How dare you walk in now? Sorry, I'm preaching. I didn't mean to preach to the preacher. <laughs> I jumped up from the table and I followed him. I was maybe 10 paces behind him and he didn't look back. And my girlfriend was already verbalizing, you know what's going to happen, Ryan. And she went out of earshot. 
He gets to that door, hangs left, exits the store. The door comes to a close, and then I was at the door, burst through the door, and he was gone. He was gone. Yep. I told this. I love this story. It gives me chills, man, every time. But you always add something I didn't get before. You know, Mo. Yeah. We have a friend, Dina Morataya. I was telling her this story and she asked me a question I'd never thought of. I'm chasing what was clearly an angel out of this restaurant. And she said, what would you have done if you opened that door? And he was there. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord has mercy on us and our foolishness. <laughs> I go back to the table. And when I went to sit down, the young lady is still crying. And I said, he wasn't there. And she said, I knew that he would not be. And everything in my life went excellent from then on. I got wealthy, <laughs> not at all. It was the beginning, as the Bible says, of sorrows. But I have known since then that through the valley, through the fire, Lord got his hand on me. Lord got his hand on you. Lord has his hand yes. on you. Yes. Not that we are special, but that God who took time to die for us takes time to encourage us and to call us to his work. Mm -hmm. And I'm humbled by that. Even Pastor Neary and I are working together not normal how we came together. I was sitting doing my own thing. This man was in the room, didn't know me, this is years ago. Walked over, put a hand on my shoulder and says from inspiration, you need an old man to be your mentor. I'm not calling you old, I'm just saying yeah, what you yeah, said. Right. Is what you <laughs> I think everybody can see that. <laughs> Pastor, I'm talking. Can you close us out, man? Pray us. Uh, say something wise. Well, I, I, I'm going to because, you know, I just finished rereading the book of Job. And your story so parallels the book of Job. It's amazing. And in the end, he is better off than his beginning. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there was all this conflict and confusion and pain and hurt. But God doesn't, like you said, he doesn't give up. And, and so we have a saying here at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church. We tell our people as often as necessary, God doesn't just speak to the preacher. He speaks to his people. And so what we must give him, God, the opportunity, and that's through Bible study and prayer. And his voice, if we're pers persistent, will become clear, clear, clear. About that, Pastor Neary? Would you have a prayer for us? Close us out. I will be more than happy to, but I do have a question for you because uh -oh. it, it caught up to my brain just now. Mm -hmm. Mo asked you that question, what were you going to do if the guy was there? But yes. My question is, when you came back to the table after he disappeared and you couldn't find him, how did you feel or what did you think at that point about your future? You know, that's, that is interesting, and that's not a part of the story I've thought about a lot. As I recall, when I looked over the parking lot, and I mean, I looked for a few seconds and saw for sure that, that the young man was not there. Um, I turned back, the door began to close. I had attracted the attention of some of the people that were eating kind of a college area, so they're young people. And you know, uh, they didn't like go overboard in their attention, but they were looking. 
I walk back to the table and the young lady is sitting there and um, she's looking at me expectantly. She's still crying. I told her no one was there before I sat down. And before I sat down, she said, and it, and it had a tone such as, you know better than that. She goes, you know, you know, of course he wasn't there. So I then sit down and we're talking excitedly. Like, did you see what just happened? And we're, you know, relaying it back and forth, uh, the story. I was no longer angry. Um, the wonder began to set in. She was afraid. I was afraid, but the fear didn't set in until later on when we were telling my parents. And I remember them sitting there. My dad has this way of just looking cool no matter what. And the building burned down. He is really did it now. Uh, so he has the cool look on his face to the point that I, I even wondered if they, if they believed this. But it was later on that night that, that I guess the word is fear. And it's not, you know this, it's not fear like a snake. It's, you're just shaking. The tears did not come as a result of that experience until years later. Wow. Standing in the pulpit. Yeah. Mama in the congregation. Years later, standing overseas in the pulpit. Then the impact hit. I don't know if I was just young and foolish. Young people have a way of not appreciating the import of things. But certainly as I got older and I would dream about this event or my wife would remind me of this event and I would see the fruition of his words come forth in fine detail. The fear still hits, you know, but on that day, I was too young and excited to really fully appreciate what had just taken place. Now, I'm giving young people a bad name. The young lady was just as young. She had more sense than I did. Well, I, I appreciate you taking extra time to tell that because every time I hear the story, I think I already said this, you, you add elements that I hadn't heard before, which makes it even more exciting. I'd love to hear you tell that story. But I had never asked you before what you thought when you came back to the table. But I can see that that has, you know, it's, it's sat there in the, in the hard drive. <laughs> and I'm sure it was working on you. There are aspects, now that I'm thinking about it, such as, I mean, I got my French fries. Um, and that's the most important thing, guys, yeah, that right. you know, as we're leaving, you know, we're walking through the parking lot and even then looking around to see, are we going to see this yeah, guy? Yeah, he's, he's is, hanging around. Well, actually, is anything going to happen to debunk this so I can say, oh, it was just a guy? You know what I mean? Oh, there he is. It wasn't anything supernatural. No. And then driving in the car or here it is being alone in the room at night and it's time to turn the light out and realizing after the light is out, somebody is still watching you. So yeah. you're giving me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Now I gotta go back through therapy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, it's a good fear. And um, this is a li little bit outside of the subject, but Pastor Neary and I will very often encounter persons who have had certain experiences and we ask them how they feel. There's a certain kind of fear, it's a good fear, an encouraging fear if there's such a thing, that takes place when you are in the presence of God. And there's a completely different kind of fear that takes place when you are in the presence of someone or something or are somewhere that you ain't supposed to be. But we'll talk about that on another day. Yeah, I didn't mean sure. to open that can of right. roaches. Anyway, Pastor. <laughs> well, we, I, I think we have two things to do here, and then I would like to pray again. Um, thank you for being with us, and we, we hope that these two stories are not about us, mm -hmm. but they're about us.
all of us that God is willing to talk. And if you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that right now. And if you feel you need some support in that decision, then come and visit us here at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church, 4575 South Sand Hill Road, right here in Las Vegas. And we'll be glad to listen and to pray with you. Mm. For God is speaking to his people. Yes, he is. So let's pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be present with our friends that, that are, have joined us. And, and to know that you love us all equally, you have, you're no respecter of persons, and the Bible clearly states that you want all your children in heaven, and that even includes people that I may not like, Pastor Johnson may not like, but you love us all, Lord. And so we see the value of every person. Help us now to be faithful, and hopefully we can meet together that you would impress our friends to come and join us and we can rejoice together in your how you move upon our lives and how you include us Lord in your kingdom and thank you for hearing this prayer as we pray in Jesus name amen amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to sharing more testimonies with you in the future. Yes. It's just Pastor Neary, I'm Pastor Johnson, and as always, friends, be, be encouraged. Courage, yes.